Well, I had done Watership Down, which is sort of Richard Adams' great tour de force. And because of the success of that picture, I looked at that book and I felt it was such an intriguing project, undoable, of course, that I felt I had to look at it anyway. And the more I looked at it, the more I studied it, the more I liked it and felt that I probably could make it. Uh, two, two realms, one, make it creatively and make it financially, get the financing in, in which to do it. Uh, and so I negotiated for the rights and did get them. I didn't realize how difficult a project it would be, ultimately. But one never does. We can go through it, Ralph. They'd only bring us back. We can do it. We can get out of here. It's, it's safe in here. I don't mean out of your kennel. I mean out of here. The whole place. Talking dogs in a serious picture. Um, people are not really used to, at, at that time, this was a long time ago, were not used to having uh, animated characters in uh, difficult situations. And because we're so tuned into having dogs as pets, we, it was hard to see them in a situation where they were, in effect, prisoners and being tested. And uh, I, I, that was the, one of the major challenges. I didn't know what I was going to do. I, you know, I didn't know what a ship down would be. A, get the financing for it. B, make it. As you know, we had to redo it. And then three, whether Watership Down would be successful enough to be able to generate sufficient interest uh, to get financing for it. But fortunately, the same investors that, uh, that uh, were in the Watership Down project uh, came on board. And uh, I decided I want to do it in America this time, however, and brought most of my major key staff over to uh, do the work here in San Francisco. And come with me, old Ralph. We're free. I think it was very loyal and very, uh, very tuned to what the book was. Uh, Richard Adams, who passed away just, just recently, as many authors feel, uh, the book is the book. And anything other than the book is almost not worthy of discussion. Uh, but I think he respected the book. I think he respected the work I was trying to do. And we maintained a, a cordial relationship during the shooting. Look, Ralph, look. Everything's so still in there. If I was in there, covered over, my head would be cool. Things would keep still. Actually, you know, you're interpreting what the original author says, and you think you know what he's saying, and you try very hard to show that on film. On the other hand, there's a lot of stuff in the book that you don't really agree with or feel is right, like the ending. I felt that the ending was too convenient. Uh, the, the dogs were rescued at the last minute, and all that. I, I expect that would have been much more satisfying to an audience. I just felt just was it just couldn't happen. These dogs were doomed from day one, and the demise was the thing we're leading to, and how that was realized was what I was really going after. Are you all right? I think, yes, I think so. We had uh, six of our principal animators, seven of our personnel, the director, uh, uh, first was Tony Guy, then he had a personal situation back in the UK and he, t he had to return uh, and we brought in someone else who was on staff. Uh, Colin White was my, uh, one of my senior animators who I really uh, admired a lot. He was very witty and very um, attuned to things and I asked him if he would take over and uh, as director animation director, and he did a superb job, uh, and I'm internally grateful for his contribution to the picture. We couldn't even find our way back to the White Coats. I mean, supposing we wanted to. Do you want 
to go back? I don't know. There's nothing up here. I don't think anyone's been up here since it was made. I tend to look at an animator as an actor rather than, you know, they're, they're doing the acting. No. The actors that do the voiceover are not the actors. The animator's a key, and as soon as you get that as a non-animation person, everything come, comes into focus. And it's a lot, if not easier, and not a lot more um, um, realistic on how one is to perform as a director. Brad was on, on the unit, and uh, I fired him. They tell me, I don't even remember Brad Bird, uh, much to my chagrin. Uh, I'm a huge admirer of all his work. There's nothing, I, I saw Iron Giant and I wrote him a effusive letter congratulating him on it. I didn't get a response. Uh, why would I respond to someone that fired me? Uh, you know, clearly an uh, extraordinarily talented man in every, in every respect and one of the first owners of the Tesla in, in this area. I think it was a little roadster. That too I admire him for. It's pretty grim in most respects, particularly the lab scenes had to be a very dark tone. And even when they escaped from the lab, you couldn't suddenly celebrate it because they were going from a certain doom to probable doom. And you had to, and they, when I say things like this, I have to say, why did I make this picture? <laughs> how, many, how many people would enjoy seeing this? The answer was not enough. It got, uh, it got a considerable amount of acclamation, but uh, the audiences did not uh, go. And uh, I recall we were playing at a cinema up in uh, Seattle, a uh, very fine cinema, the Egyptian. Mm -hmm. And I had some friends that ran it, and it was doing really no business at all over Christmas time. And we had the pink section of the big papers up there for uh, on a weekend during Christmas, and nobody still came. And... Uh, I asked people coming out of the cinema after a performance, I said, uh, what do you think about the picture? And I said, oh, you don't want to see this, it's too depressing. <laughs> and at that time I told my pal who was the exhibitor, I said, I, I would understand if you want to take it out. So it was, uh, at that time, misconceived. The audience was not prepared for it, whether it was my fault as a, as a creator or as a producer or, uh, for whatever reason, it did not attract the kind of audience I thought it might. And I had sort of a, uh, an ego trip uh, fighting against everybody to make Watership Down and having that prove to be successful, saying, I can do that again. Well, I couldn't do it again, uh, commercially anyway. Masters are different, Ralph. You will see what I mean when we found one. Hmm. Suppose there aren't any masters left. What then? There must be. It's just that I wasn't expecting this. It had, you have several objectives when you uh, make a film. You want to do it and create something that is respectful of the original material, in my case, the Plague Dogs, and then to have it earn some reward back, not only for me, which is certainly important, but for the people that worked on the picture, because not seeing your, the results of your work is depressing. And uh, that proved to be a difficult part of it. They said, when is it coming out? You know, we showed it in the UK. And I recall when it opened in the UK with great expectations because of Watership Down, we showed it at a cinema in the West End. And the manager, who's a good friend of mine, was standing next to me. <laughs> These two ladies walked up the stairs, and because we were standing aside, they said to us, any one of you young men responsible for this picture? And uh, said, he made it. <laughs> and one of the women said, how can you do that to those dogs and hit me with her umbrella? And I said, this is not going to go well. <laughs> so... It was, an, it, it was an augury of, uh, uh, of uh, the future. But uh, as I said, I mean, it, it opened on the West End, huge things and signs in Piccadilly, uh, you know, uh, 24 sheets uh, announcing it, uh, and everybody had great expectation for it, but it, it, it didn't do its job. 
It's got this green collar, Jack. Nothing on it but a number. Let's put it in the back of the car line and get it off the road. Bloody hell. <laughs> I deliver this very difficult film uh, that was in opposition to everything we, all our conceptions about dogs and animals, nice, and animation, always funny, always nice. I had that problem of Watership Down where they expected rabbits to have little hats and canes, uh, which they didn't. So this took it a step further, made it even more difficult. I mean, never let it be said that I went the easy way. <laughs> Uh, I was encouraged to, because of the lack of uh, distribution uh, success of the film, is to cut one particular, seg one particular segment out, which I thought was very important, where the dogs are being tracked by a hunter. And as, as he takes his shot, uh, he falls. And uh, you see the body at the bottom and then you see these two starving dogs go toward the body and you know they're gonna eat it. And I felt that was important, but they just said, uh, we don't want pets to eat humans. And so I took it out and I, I, I regret that. Um, but you have responsibility to your distributor. You, you wanna let them get the bang for their buck as much as they can. But I think it did alter the perception of the film. We didn't think for, far enough down the line to say, would that really make a difference? Well, it didn't. And that's what hurts, uh, taking out something that didn't give it the boost that they wished it would have, but uh, there, there it was. So we did what we could. I, I tried to uh, 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 do what they felt was needed to be done. What's that up ahead? By the face of Dow Crag. Can you get closer? I thought the music was terrific. Uh, Pat Gleason did the music and uh, he's a wonderfully talented composer. I mean, at one point when the dogs are running out to sea, there's a Polish composer called Ludosowski who creates um, uh, uh, strange sounds by having everyone wear earphones, not of what everyone's playing, but just of what they're playing, so they can't hear other people. So everything is a little off kilter and a little kind of scratchy like. And I wanted that abrasive sense going as they're running out toward the sea. There they are. Let me rest a while. Wake me with. I mean, I was talking about uh, the treatment of animals in laboratories, and there's been a lot of improvement in that area, considerable improvement, and government control over things, and lying, government lying. Well, we know about that these days quite a bit. Uh, so certain of those aspects of the film uh, generated a degree of interest and probably would generate more interest today. Uh, but you, you don't think about that. I mean, I just loved the book. I felt it was important. We'll do what they're doing, don't you see? And then the man will take us home with him. Oh, what luck! My master used to throw sticks or a ball. Well, they like you to run about and do things. Well, this man uses sheep instead of sticks, that's all. Oh, we'll show them, Ralph. We'll show them. The dogs were such interesting characters. How they changed during the make during the their 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 escape. They changed personalities. One dog never felt anything good was happening. The other, yes, we're going to find the right master. And then little by little, it turned around until they met their predestined fate out in the Irish Sea. I can't seem to move legs anymore. Well, keep going. Try. I have to say, though, 
of the films that I've made, I am most proud of that film. I am most proud of, of The Plague Dogs. I think it did exactly what I wanted it to do. I got wonderful performances from John Hurt and the other people there. It was just a delight to work with everybody, and however dark it might be, it, it is the picture I intended to make. There he is. Island. <laughs>